Uh, Mike is a neurologist who I've known for a long time. He's one of the world experts, along with uh, uh, Dr. Hamilton, in normal pressure hydrocephalus, and he's recently joined the department, which I'm excited about. He has some very diverse and interesting research uh, interests and is involved in the adult hydrocephalus clinical research network, with, uh, which all the residents know from the PEDS end, but they've developed an adult network now. Very engaged with NASA, doing some interesting research. Uh, astronauts seem to get MPH if they're in space for an extended period of time. So some very cool stuff that's new to the department. And he and Mark have been friends for a very uh, long time, so I thought it would be more appropriate for him to introduce Mark. So, thank Thanks very much. Actually, astronauts are developing pseudo tumor, not, not to make it any easier than for them. Yeah. Uh, well, so, so good morning, and it's really my pleasure to introduce Mark Hamilton uh, to you. I'll go over a little bit of it, his uh, educational background and then tell you why he's here to, to talk to us about hydrocephalus. Uh, he graduated from uh, the McGill University Medical School and took his neurosurgery training at the University of Calgary. And then not being tired of, of learning and training, he took fellowships in cerebrovascular skull base and pediatric neurosurgery at Barrow. Uh, and then returned to the University of Calgary, where he's been on faculty since 1994, and he's professor of neurosurgery. He's been chief of the Division of Pediatric Neurosurgery um, uh, between 2002 and 2011, and is currently the director of the Neurosurgical Oncology Program. Uh, and Mark is quite productive. He's got over 80 peer-reviewed publications, 30, 30 reviews or book chapters, and my most recent discovery of, of his work is that he's the editor of the Handbook of Bleeding and Coagulation for Neurosurgery, which was published just a couple of years ago. And it's one of those books you want to have on your bookshelf when you've got a patient who needs to go to the OR and, and there may be some bleeding issues. Uh, in the field of hydrocephalus, I met Mark about five or six years ago, and he's established the University of Calgary Adult Hydrocephalus Program and Clinic in 2008. And by virtue of that, he provides expert care for almost all adults with hydrocephalus in the province of Alberta, uh, which is quite a large population, and he's been able to learn much about the epidemiology of hydrocephalus as a result. He, in fact, founded and is the chair of the Adult Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network, and he's the secretary treasurer and will soon be the president-elect of the International Society for Hydrocephalus and CSF Disorders. Uh, he's on the board of directors for the Hydrocephalus Association, which is the largest patient advocacy group for hydrocephalus in the United States. And uh, many of you attended the Hydrocephalus 2015 conference in Banff last September, uh, which was very successful and, and we were well represented there. So Mark's interests are in adult hydrocephalus, including the transitional population, uh, newly acquired hydrocephalus in young and middle-aged adults, as well as many of the other disorders of CSF circulation. And today he's going to share his thoughts with us on how to change the treatment paradigm for adult hydrocephalus. Mark, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you, and uh, I can't pull the mic up any higher, so if you can't hear me, let me know and I'll bend down. Uh, but thank you, for Sam, and for Rich for inviting me. It's, uh, uh, we're here doing some other things as well, but it's been a great pleasure. A lovely, uh, lovely place. Uh, I would say that the weather's better than ours, but actually we're probably almost as warm in Calgary right now as uh, you are in Seattle. Seattle. This is going to be a, a bit of a, uh, an overview of many different aspects of adult hydrocephalus care uh, and sort of trying to sort of get us to not just think about uh, hydro adult hydrocephalus, but think about how we can change the way we approach hydrocephalus. Can everybody hear me? Uh, so the. Uh, uh, for disclosure, uh, I've been a consultant with Medtronic Canada and Cognitive Canada and uh, many of the other things you've already heard about, but I'll try and be unbiased uh, as I go through and uh, uh, I will willingly admit that I use uh, whatever works, it doesn't matter what company it comes from. Uh, so what I want to try and do is just give you an overview of the, what I call the mission issues. You can't approach hydrocephalus without looking at the bigger picture. We'll talk about uh, surgical management issues. Uh, and. Uh, um, uh, some specific issues related to what we can do to change uh, the way we approach inserting particular peritoneal shunts, and then talk a wee bit about third ventriculostomy in a particular patient population. So, with this issue of our concept of improving adult hydrocephalus care, 
this is what I think is sort of the mission uh, 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 issues. And I'm not going to obviously address these, but you can't do one without the other eventually. So you have to do these in parallel. And so we need, definitely need increased awareness. I think this is a highly unrecognized, undertreated patient population that does not have proper service uh, uh, in the neurosurgical and neurological communities. We need to have better ways to diagnose uh, these patients, we need better ways to treat these patients, we need better outcomes. So all very, very uh, high level sort of goals, but we can start chipping away at these uh, to, uh, to make change. And so this is what I talk about as uh, the plea for passion. I think uh, we need to, uh, one, embrace it as a global disease, not as a, something that we want to try and avoid. Uh, it shouldn't be a part-time effort of neurosurgeons. Programs need to have people who do this the way programs have functional neurosurgeons and serve vascular neurosurgeons. We need to have dedicated clinics that look after patients of all, of all types of hydrocephalus. So if you're an adult, there's a place to go. This is a chronic disease that needs lifelong management. And we need to use objective diagnostic and diagnostic outcome measures. It's going to come up over and over again. We need data. We need validated measures to follow these patients. So we stop talking about some of the things that are very limiting and constrict our view of what happens with these patients. Every program should have these four things. And you know, I don't have all these things yet in Calgary, but that's the goal that should be the aim. But if you start off with good local clinical care, that's pretty obvious. Uh, you need patient support. You need to involve patients in uh, the process. There's lots of things we don't understand about what's happening to these patients. We learn that by talking to them and engaging them. Clinical research is essential. In the, so the, and then basic research. You've got a lot of these elements already here in place in, uh, uh, in Seattle. Uh, especially with the pediatric uh, hydrocephalus population. And I think in, in general, pediatric neurosurgery has uh, done a better job and is doing a better job with hydrocephalus management than the adult neurosurgical uh, groups. And I think that's just because of the nature of what happened with pediatrics and how uh, hydrocephalus evolved and treatments evolved. So how common is this? Uh, difficult to tell you. Uh, Know, with certainty about incidents because most of it's using surrogate measures. So we're looking at shunt insertion. <coughs> but let's look at prevalence based on those kinds of numbers. In infants, about 135 to 100,000. If you look at young adults, 40, 50 year olds, it's a mishmash in the literature, very hard to get any real numbers. And then you look at the elderly. I think this is uh, a number that's getting refined as more studies come out, we, we, we determine these numbers with a systematic review meta-analysis methodology. So 239,000. And you know, there's a recent paper that suggests that 5.9% of those over the age of 80 uh, will have uh, NPH. That's a treatable cause of dementia. Uh, and so that's a huge number of patients. That's the only treatable cause of dementia that currently exists. Let's put that in context of what actually is going on with other diseases. Adult hydrocephalus in the over 65 population is actually more common than epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, and uh, a number of other diseases. We can go through and pull from different websites the, you know, the, what the various uh, support groups tell us is the epidemiology from looking at the literature. If you adult hydrocephalus is probably more common, but we still don't service that population in the same way. So within the, the group of the adult hydrocephalus patients, it's not just one disease. And I'm going to not sort of, there's lumpers and splitters. I'm going to split this up into four categories because I think it's more of a pragmatic approach to what we see, what I've seen over the years. But it helps uh, because each of these patient populations carry some uh, different uh, issues and they have different approaches in terms of how you can uh, treat them. So I, I talk about the transitional patients, so treated as a child, now an adult. A growing group of patients, again, not getting proper service. Uh, we've done all this work to keep these children uh, alive to improve their quality of life, their length of life. And so in many places, they're abandoned when they get 18 years of age. Arrested, compensated, chronic hydrocephalus. This, this particular group, is a, you've seen that scan with the big ventricles, of compensated, chronic hydrocephalus. And, what do you do with them? And we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Acquired hydrocephalus, probably the most common type of hydrocephalus that most people encounter in other subspecialties, subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
trauma. It used to be uh, infection, but we see that as much in adults anymore. And then idiopathic and pressure hydrocephalus. And again, remember, it's a chronic disease. This is not a fix and then they go, they should go away. These patients need to be followed long term. So I uh, set up an adult hydrocephalus clinic initially starting as a transitional patient clinic of the pediatric neurosurgery. We looked after our patients. That was when they became adults. That was a model in Calgary. And eventually it just sort of morphed into uh, I became the adult hydrocephalus person and the disease actually was very interesting and started to do more and more with this. So just to give you an idea of how, how many are out there, and this is not a registry, this is not a bring the problem, so just to see what, what we're, we started with and then where we were at in 2013. We did have a registry of sorts of the, again, the patients that had come through our system we're looking at just over 1,300 patients. We have about 900 that are active. So these missing patients are patients that have literally fallen off the grid that we don't have a way to find. They've moved away and various things have happened. But just to show you the proportions at this time and what we deal with, our transitional patients, over 235 of them. Our arrested compensated uh, chronic hydrocephalus patients, again, we gotta find a better name for this, uh, about 220 of these patients talk a bit more about these patients. So what are the clinical issues? So quite often these people with big ventricles <coughs> showing up uh, in their mid-50s, 40s, uh, they're coming in because they've had a CT scan, they have a headache, they have a head injury. And really, I put down headache here because headache, while it's the most common clinical entry issue, is the least responsive to treatment. And if you shunt these patients to try and fix their headache, uh, you often will create a snowball effect that will get you and the patient into a very unhappy mode. You don't make them better this way. You do have some effect on headaches for some patients, but it's not the key driver. Cognitive function is the key driver. And I think the question of you know, treat or not treat is based, should be based on cognitive function predominantly, unless you have high ICP. One of the challenges with these patients is that they have something that has happened when they've been younger they have limited cognitive reserve. So insults, infection, trauma, have a much more significant effect on these patients. And at some point, earlier in life rather than later in life, they start to decline in terms of their cognitive function. I've seen patients in their 40s and 50s who have lost employment. Uh, one guy who had lost his family, he was homeless, all because he had untreated aqueductal stenosis. And people, uh, general practitioners don't know how to deal with this. They get a report that says it's compensated hydrocephalus. And well, what do they do with that? They, they should, all they should know is that somebody with big ventricles needs somebody who can help sort it out. And so this is an important patient population. These are people in the, really in the prime of their life, and they have a totally treatable problem. So if you want to look at criteria for uh, treatment in this patient population, you're not going to find it. You're going to find a lot of different approaches. Um, so I, at some point, decided I needed to have my own criteria, so at least I could move forward and start to look at things. So the criteria I used, and the debate these at any point, was uh, is there a, obviously if there's an increased uh, intracranial pressure, I think that was pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a history of declining cognitive function. We always ask these patients to come with a significant other or family. And if you get a clear story of things uh, deteriorating, that was a red flag. And then we started at, at a point, and uh, I'll show you some of the numbers, to actually measure cognitive function. When we could, we would get formal neurocognitive batteries, and then uh, a number of years ago, we started doing at least MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment on Patients, and we've added a number of different layers to try and sort of probe uh, where they're at. And if a patient had poor cognitive function and really couldn't afford to lose any more, then that was another indication that uh, treatment should be tried. So I'll just show you our brief experience with this. Uh, so we had 200 patients at a registry, 153 that were patients I had uh, uh, actively enrolled in the, uh, the process. Look at that mean age, 57, 58 years of age. So that's, at least that's my age. And we, you know, that's a, so becoming, developing dementia. This isn't something that's happened overnight. These people are talking about things that have been going on for years and nobody's, sort of picked up on the fact, other than the fact things aren't right and you start being dysfunctional at work. And again, totally treatable. So you look at this uh, group of 153, a uh, large, uh, or uh, the whole group rather, a large group with active 
stenosis, what I call aqueductal patterns. They look like aqueductal stenosis, but the aqueduct is still patent, but it looks quite small. They've got a triventricular pattern. It's really aqueductal stenosis, and they felt some other compensatory drainage pathway. A technical glioma, and then you get a sort of mishmash of a few other things. So this patient population is important because endoscopic periodic velocity plays a big role in high speed. So, you know, these are the patients where we, we, sometimes with ventricles, the people will say you can drive a truck to that. Well, you don't really want to be looking forward to putting a shunt into that because of lower drainage issues. But third ventriculostomy works very well for many of these patients. And it's an important thing to consider uh, when you're seeing them. What I haven't figured out is how to select which ones can respond to third ventricle and which ones not. So they get about an 80% response rate with third ventriculostomy. And I'm hoping as we collect more prospective information, we can look back and try and figure out ways to sort through these patients. Uh, we, you know, we look at looking at MR anatomy of the third ventricle. We look at MR anatomy after third ventriculostomy. We try and sort of, again, a number of other factors trying to piece together a pattern that we can use earlier on. So with this first 153 patients, the first important thing is that some are doing okay. They don't need to have treatment the day they show up. However, they need follow-up. They have to be followed long-term. I've got patients. In this group, who have come back and have had cognitive decline <coughs> and required treatment. I've had one uh, more recently who actually uh, had to, we did a third ventriculostomy. And we can, we can we measure things just the way we follow, our family doctors follow blood pressure, uh, internists follow blood pressure. We have to measure cognitive uh, uh, function so that we can look for uh, uh, changes. Uh, I, most of these were treated with about uh, three quarters with the ETV, and this is a mishmash of again, it's not it's not a prospective trial. It's, it evolved over time, but certainly ETV was very important for a lot of these patients. With a small, about 15 to 20 percent going on to uh, is requiring a shunt. When you look at their their issues, cognitive was the most common. So this is a group of patients that, that were uh, uh, had surgery, and if you look at gait was and uh, headache uh, and the bladder urgency were there for many patients, but this was the most significant factor. And we look at uh, cognitive function, uh, most were better after surgery or the same, very few worse. Gait and the headache, um, we need quanti I think uh, objective measures, we need to have some scales to look at uh, headache, so we can try and do some pain measurement. Uh, uh, and gait we're now, uh, we're now looking at um, urinary uh, incontinence improved in the vast majority of patients, but cognition stabilized or got better. We have a subset of patients where we did neuropsych testing pre and post, and we have not made anybody worse with their ventriculostomy. We have improved or stabilized the vast majority, and in the vast majority of these patients, we have a history of decline. And this is a group of patients that needs much more study as we go along. We're now doing a MOCA on the most, of, most of these, and we see a mean MOCA score of about 24 or a median of 26. So this is somebody in their 50s. 26 might be, some people say, well, that's a normal score, but you know, that's normal in a population over 80 when they're trying to differentiate Alzheimer's or not Alzheimer's. If you're 58, you've got a MOCA score of 25 or 26. You're, you're not doing very well. The beauty of ETV is it can eliminate the need for a shunt in many of these patients. And if all these patients long term, they continue to do well. But you have to keep following them. There's a low complication rate, uh, rarely failures. Uh, unfortunately, we get to talk about NPH, it doesn't really have much of a role there at all, and that's the biggest population that we have uh, on the horizon. Acquired patients, so that at the time we did this, that was just under half of the patients we saw. Uh, we now uh, either put the shunts in these patients, we do the assessments, in, 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 or if they're put in by one of the subspecial the, uh, neurosurgeons, we absorb them into the clinic for follow-up afterwards. <coughs> and then NPH. So at the time of this, we had about 250 patients. This is the, our fastest growing patient population for assessment. Uh, and a, a group that is, I think, extremely important to know more about. Um, it, because it's not a rare disease. We're showing you some numbers. It's a very common disease. Uh, I often get uh, told it's an orphan disease. Uh, it's not an orphan disease, I think it's an ignored disease. I don't think we've really taken on this uh, problem the way we should. There's a lot more that can be done, and I think we're in the, on the process of proving that uh, by collect, doing some of the things we're going to talk about in a minute. We need to do a lot more for these types of patients. Basic, very quick summary of NCH is that all symptoms can improve. <coughs> I have 
so many patients that have come in unable to walk in wheelchairs, uh, walking with walkers barely, bedridden, who are now ambulating independently. That's a very important thing that you can do to help the patient. And all the others, in terms of dementia, there's, there's good evidence that this kind of stuff can improve. These, these things can improve. And there's literature such as this where we see these types of improvements being documented. And the pushback has always been, well, you don't have a randomized trial. And I think until we have something along a blinded randomized trial, we may never get the naysayers to accept this. But this is a treatable disease. The people that work in it know that. And so we just have to expand that understanding, make more people aware of it. So again, just going on to uh, what we can do in our clinic, I think you know, it's not just looking after uh, NPH patients, it's not just looking after uh, uh, one particular type, a subtype of uh, patient uh, population. And we come back to talk at the end about the adult clinical research network. Uh, I'll show you that what we've identified is basically different types of centers in our network because of our interests. In my particular clinic, I see everybody. And so it's given me a real advantage of seeing an overview of the entire population. It's also shown me that it's a rather large population. And so I can show you that you know, we started our clinic in 2009, and we had 100 patient visits. In 2015, we had 1,200. And we're not actively recruiting patients. These are just happening. 209 new patient assessments last year. I, I think we're barely scratching uh, the surface of this. There's a lot more out there. In terms of procedures, uh, we did 40 in uh, 2009, 131 last year. Again, everything just keeps going up because we see more patients. So we, do, we use third ventriculostomy again for that uh, chronic hydrocephalus population. We try that a lot. Uh, uh, as a tragic, we also do all, I do all the folate cysts with the scope. So we've got a, Third ventriculostomy is a really useful tool uh, and should be part of any adult hypercephalus program. So, just to show you an example of the benefits, I'm sure you've all seen this type of uh, uh, video presentation, but I'll just show you one patient. Uh, so, just to emphasize how we should be treating these patients. This guy's a little younger than the average NPH patient. Uh, he came in with a two month history of gait and cognitive issues, no headache, no pathodema. A two-person assist for transfer. This guy had uh, uh, sort of a moderate severity of schizophrenia, and he had been really written off, and they were about to ship him back to uh, another center, uh, and somebody put a consult into us, and we went to see him. I'll just show you this, uh, I'll show you his uh, CT scan in a minute, but this was his video beforehand. He was very cognitively slow. This guy talked really slow. He's looking down at the ground because he has no idea where his feet are. He cannot figure out how to make a speed move. <coughs> this is two days after a drain was put in. He became much more animated, he's much more engaged with the conversation, and he actually is sitting up at the edge of the bed, he actually stands up on his own without any assistance. And he uh, was shunted. This is his uh, <coughs> early post-op. This is later on. And you know, his ventricles didn't change a lot of his size, but this is what he looked like six months later. Now, this guy lived about three hours away. He came up on the bus by himself. So this is a guy who didn't have papilledema, didn't have raise into cranial pressure in the way we usually think about it, but he had very significant chronic hydrocephalus and needed treatment. And I shunted him rather than ETV just because of the nature of the rest of the scan. And we have, again, lots of patients <laughs> uh, like that. Uh, and we use uh, uh, ETV, or sorry, we use the lumbar drains, we use lumbar punctures, large volume taps, the way to sort out some of these patients. Uh, and we don't have the time to go through all that today, but I'll just, uh, say that that's a very valuable tool uh, to uh, uh, determine whether somebody's going to be responsive. In a simplistic fashion, it mimics what we do with the shunt. And if you can't mimic what we do with the shunt doing that, then it's going to be pretty hard to do that with the shunt. So let's talk about shunts. So everybody knows the mainstay of treatment, simple, we divert fluid from one cavity to another. 
uh, and it's had a significant effect on uh, uh, survival among children. There's a little bit of literature in adults. Uh, uh, it tends to be uh, uh, not uh, more review papers and uh, you know, single center studies, which we'll talk about in a minute. We've got these three basic types of shunts, you've got VP shunts, uh, VA shunts, and LP shunts. And what we have is no evidence that any of these are better than, than the other. And you know, we just know that in North America, the VP shunt is the most common. In places like Japan, the LP shunt is taking off. It's a much more common type of shunt that's used. And the uh, Japanese Neurosurgical Society is already way ahead of us. They have their version of the guidelines for assessment and treatment of NPH. And they talk about a lot of the technical issues related to treatment with the shunt in these guidelines. So I think shunt technology and technique has improved, but we've got a long way to go. Uh, shunts are effective, but I think on the whole, uh, most people view them as problematic. And anything that would be able to replace the shunt in the future <coughs> would be a real asset, a real benefit. A medical treatment down the road, perhaps. A third ventriculosity when we can. We have to work with this, so we've got to find a way to make this a little better and less problematic. And again, we have literature on shunt problems. So just to summarize what the shunt problems, I think most people in the room are aware of these, but let's talk about them, uh, sort of drill down to them a bit. So we have shunt failure, um, immediate and delayed. We have shunt under drainage. A lot of patients who put a shunt into a really not treatment problem. Just because you've got the shunt in doesn't necessarily mean you're taking care of it. Again, we need to do objective measures. Shunt over drainage, you know, that's the one that everybody fears, the chronic subarachnoid hematoma, and then shunt infection. So the challenges with understanding shunt uh, complications is that if you say, what's the definition of shunt failure? Most people will say, well, they had to have another surgery. But I don't think that's really good enough. We need to have better uh, terminology. We need to we need better definitions. What's the denominator? Uh, quite often with these populations, we have, we have no idea when reports come up what the denominator is. We really have no understanding, and that changes everything. So uh, we'll come to some spe specific things in a moment. Most of the studies are retrospective, most of them are single center, and most of them have a lot of bias. So they're, they're useful to a point, they point us in the right direction, but they don't <coughs> answer any of the problems that need to be uh, solved right now. This is one of my favorite slides. So insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That describes how shunts have been used for the last 30 or 40 years. We had a few major modifica you know, modifications, programmable valves came along. But on the whole, people just keep doing it over and over the same way. So why not step back and try and look at how can we make it better? So what can we do? One, as I mentioned, that develop a vocabulary. We need common terms, we need definitions. So what does shunt malfunction mean? And I'll put a few things up in a minute. Collect data with objective measures. So uh, use validated measures. And not just the measure for most shunt malfunction uh, papers, which is just they went to the OR, how many people had it had in second surgery. Uh, clinical improvement methodology, you know, the PDSA cycle. And you can do that locally and accomplish a lot. You don't have to wait for the next randomized kind of trial to come out because there haven't been that many that have come out. You can think about what's going wrong and uh, modify how you do things to make it better. Clinical research networks, we'll talk a bit about AHCR in a moment, I think are essential uh, to get away from the single institution uh, approach. Uh, and uh, again, it's objective uh, uh, perspective data. And randomized clinical trials come from that. So the uh, quality improvement model, I think, is a very useful one to, to, to have. And I did a lot of quality improvement earlier on and using this PDSA cycle. So you don't have to do 200 cases to figure out how to change something. You can think about something, do five cases, think about what didn't work, it did work, reevaluate it, change it again, and try something different. So you can, uh, things can evolve in a stepwise process. Let's talk about ventricular catheter placement. So traditionally, it's based upon landmarks for entry uh, and aim. Use uh, image guidance more here than in many other centers. Um, there's little evidence to support uh, whether to go with the front or whether to go with the back. There's little evidence to tell you where to get. Uh, and incorrect placement occurs anywhere from 1 to 20% of the time. 
this is a totally preventable thing. And you know, here's one of my uh, patients, and I had two in the same week. You know, a lot of these, but two in the same week. Aiming towards the ventricle, ended up in the uh, sylvian fissure, ended up with nice CSF flow from the distal end of the shunt. And when I went back to revise it the next day, still had flow, but not treating this patient's problem. So I had to do that. This is an older patient, she's about 85. A little tract hemorrhage, took her a lot longer to recover. So this is totally avoidable. I think we can make this operation safer uh, by using image guidance. And there was this nice little paper that came out in 2010 in general neurosurgery. It was a uh, prospective uh, multicenter study looking at uh, using Axiom or imaging for catheter placement versus standard approach. They stopped it at 0 to 34 per catheter placements in the Axiom group. 19% in the standard group, 75% of those patients required revisions. So why would we want to keep doing what isn't really uh, working very well uh, for uh, some of our patients? Um, so I think that uh, navigation is, uh, should be intuitive in this era, using uh, image guidance. And these are the comments however I've received. Uh, do real neurosurgeons need this? Uh, and uh, one of the uh, neurosurgeons in my group said, make sure the residents know how to do it the real way. I think using image guidance is understanding the landmarks, understanding the anatomy, and using it as a tool to enhance what you're doing. So we don't go blindly sort of poking around with the uh, image guidance probe and sort of pick a spot about checking and making sure. But it certainly improves the reliability. And it's because you're tracking the tip of this particular device. You know where that tip is all the time. And it doesn't take any extra time. It takes about five minutes to set it up, and it's it actually takes away a lot of the, you know, what I refer to as dyspepsia as you watch somebody pass a catheter and hope that it's going to end up in the right spot. So I'll just show you a, a quick uh, video of this. This is just a burr hole and we're just in the process of uh, drilling a small, or uh, burning a small hole in the dura. I just use pottery to make a hole in the dura and the pee up. And then the split screen will show you uh, the catheter being passed and I'm, I'm sure everybody's uh, seen the, the Axiom uh, uh, videos, but you really watch it in real time. You watch the catheter, you're aiming for this target that you've established, and you watch the catheter sort of slide forward and hit it with the ventricle. Simple, but very effective. So the last 50 uh, shunt placements, uh, all exactly where we want to go. So it's not a in our, in our experience, it was about uh, uh, probably about three to four percent maximum. But we've had none in this group. And we'll carry on following this. But this was a simple change to make that had a had a significant outcome. And then the issue of perineal catheter placement. Now, this can represent a number of problems uh, or different types of problems. Uh, the uh, catheter is not in the belly. We have a lot of patients who are obese multiple surgeries in the past and to get into this older patient population. Um, occasionally, a uh, catheter will extrude from the peritoneal cavity. More commonly, what you're, we're dealing with is that the shunt just is blocked. And uh, the, in pediatric patients, the most common set of blockage is in the head, and the adult is in the belly. And the catheters, you can literally take them out of the belly and they start to drip again, and then you put them back. So they've obviously been somewhere in the belly where they're blocked by either momentum or fat, occasionally down the road by scar. This was a systematic review that was just recently published looking at using uh, laparoscopic versus uh, laparotomy, and they referred to this as minimally invasive laparoscopic. And uh, it, a, a while back, uh, about a year ago, uh, I started thinking about ways to try and change what we were doing, start to look at laparoscopic. Uh, and looking at the uh, issue of distal shunt failure. When you look at the literature, it's often reported as the number of surgeries, as I mentioned. But what is the real denominator? <coughs> if you don't look very hard at these patients, you're going to have a much lower rate of, of shunt malfunction in this patient population. And so we uh, are, are trying to set up some parameters that we'll talk about in a minute and follow that and use that as our uh, bench post. Uh, Again, this distal failure is much more common. In the literature, when you look at it overall, it's 15 to 30 percent in the first year. It's pretty high, and if you're dealing with an older patient population, it's pretty tough on them when you're taking them back to surgery. So, the definitions, and I come back to definitions. How extensively do you look for it? 
so we look for neurological cognitive uh, uh, and gait changes. And then we do specific tests. So trying to again provide a framework to, to look forward uh, as we make changes. Um, nuclear medicine flow study is a useful te test. It's not the be all and end all, but it's a useful test. Uh, we don't do infusion testing, and then sometimes you'll see CT changes. And uh, here's two interesting papers, uh, one retrospective and one prospective. Um, and it shows some of the complexity as well as the, the, the uh, what I think is what becomes really interesting with regards to laparoscopic. This was 810 uh, consecutive cases. And there was a 20% risk of shunt failure. And interestingly, in the laparoscopic versus the lap, there's no difference in the risk of shunt failure. But distal shunt failure drops substantially. <coughs> so it's sort of like picking away at different parts of the problem. And this was a uh, underpowered perspective clinical trial. And again, distal shunt failure went from 8% in the mini lap group to 0% in the laparoscopic group. But overall, shunt failure wasn't, it wasn't different. So it tells us that in terms of distal shunt failure, it's probably a benefit. But again, and just to remind both of these papers, their major index or their major outcome measure was they had a repeat surgery. A lot of the other variables weren't looked at. But it tells us that we're, you know, there's, it's a reasonable step forward to consider. And then when you look at laparoscopic, it becomes even more confusing because there's different methods. So there's the fixed method where you anchor the catheter uh, using the false form ligament to keep it away from the amount. And there's a non-fix, which is probably the most common. Uh, and there are a lot of different descriptions of this, uh, using minimally invasive standard techniques, putting it in the belly, just making sure it's in the belly, uh, that's in the peritoneal cavity. So we, we actually started doing the, uh, the fix technique. I'll just show you a brief sort of video. We changed this since we did this, but this is the falciform ligament right here, and we're just burning a small hole in it. Catheter comes in below the zippy sternum, and then gets passed through this and then hooked around on top of the liver, uh, just up in the, uh, uh, just above the right peritoneal gutter. And uh, this is before we tuck it around behind. So we, again, are using this definition, the decline in neurological function, use it looking at change in MOCA, change in SDMT, a change in gait, a new medicine study that suggests <coughs> a problem or a CT change. <coughs> And um, we also would use the definition of infection or extrusion, those are pretty obvious ones. Now the outcome, I think it's still being evaluated. We haven't been doing it long enough to know. And we're just doing Kaplan-Meier curves on these, but our new shunt insertion failure, uh, if we look at a four-year cohort, totaled up to about just under 50%. And we've got it down to about 12% for the first 25 patients. And when you look at these, about subjective, if you don't have a shunt malfunction in the first six months to a year, especially in the NPH population, you're not going to get one for quite a while. Most of these patients go on for quite a while. It's that early sort of problem uh, period that uh, you, know, you seem to encounter. And we've also noticed for the uh, uh, people coming in for a shunt revision and using laparoscopic approach, that this has had a significant effect on uh, outcomes. And you see some of these patients, they're sort of the frequent flyer patients. You just can't seem to make their shunt work. In pediatrics, we have them. In adult neurosurgery, we have them. And uh, you know, some of these abdomens, uh, there's so much scarring inside and so many issues. I'm amazed that many of our captains had worked in the past and been looking at this. So I think this was a useful thing to look at, and we're continuing to look at it to see uh, what we can do with this. Uh, and just talk about two other things briefly. Shunt overdrainage. Uh, I think that uh, you know, uh, overdrainage can cause headache, can cause chronic subdurals. We don't really uh, uh, have a lot of headache people engaged in this patient population. I think we can improve this uh, with programmable valves, uh, uh, but we're still trying to maximize this treatment effect uh, and we need to develop further strategies. Uh, this is an example of somebody with a shunt in an overdrainage subdural. This is a horrible effect of overdrainage. This was a, 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 an older teen that was uh, treated with a uh, medium pressure valve. He had massive ventricles and just collapsed everything down. This particular type of problem we can deal with usually by reprogramming a valve. So if this is an older patient, we can make these usually go away. So we only about once a year, once every two years, have to put a, a drain into one of these to try and uh, fix them. They usually crank their 
you're shutting settings up in a bit, and it will resolve. <coughs> this is not going to resolve a lot of work. Um, and there's some, there is some recent work that's come out. Uh, this was a nice uh, study from uh, Kirsten Uviesco uh, in uh, Sweden, and they looked at uh, uh, taking a programmable valve and either starting high and coming down slowly, or just picking a number and sticking with it, which of those would make a difference. In actual fact, the two groups had the same number of overdrainage side effects, but the group that was brought down really uh, brought down rather than having the fixed setting, they actually got or had a better outcome than the, the fixed setting group. So that there's a lot that we can do with this patient population <laughs> to better understand how to treat them. So we're not doing it by the seat of our pants so often. And then infection. Infection is <coughs> it's a miserable, horrible thing that we all uh, fear and don't want. It uh, requires surgery, removal of the shunt, it's going to be a decline for the patient. It's going to be long, long hospital stays. It's really hard on patients. I think we need to uh, use, again, separate definitions and measure infections. <coughs> and I was surprised at my center that they had decided uh, to uh, do spot checks on infection. And they only identified programs that were high risk that a spot check uh, showed a problem. So I went to them uh, a number of years ago and said, I think we have a problem that's occurred and had an outbreak. Uh, we looked at the literature, it's about 6 to 10%. And so we uh, used a QI bundle. Uh, bundles, I think, have a real uh, role in this type of thing. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And you also, if you use a bundle, have to measure compliance, because bundles don't work unless you use them. So it's like seat belts. <coughs> you can have them in the car, but they have to be on. So, and uh, HCRN has done some really nice work with this. Uh, this is a study that uh, John Kessel is a primary author on with the entire HCRN group. Uh, this is a recent follow-up to their initial paper. Um, they took all these things that they could agree upon that seemed to have some role, they bundled them together, and they looked to see what happened when people veered from that bundle. And they showed that if you veer from that bundle, your infection rate goes up. If you stick to that bundle, your infection rate comes down. So the classic infection rate in kids was from the shunt valve trial uh, back in the 90s, 8.8%, and they got that down to about 57 to 6%. So this is the bundle we use in Calgary. It's a bit of a modification. Uh, we get IV antibiotics beforehand. We use chloropep. We've done away with uh, betadine. Make sure it's dry. We don't do uh, uh, antiseptic screen for, or cream rather, for, uh, uh, for hand wash, uh, the hand scrub. We double glove, we change all of our gloves after we have draped the patient. We use IOBAN to uh, field, hold them in place. I covered this up because this is underneath here the HCRN new protocol uh, where they have uh, antibiotic impregnated catheters. We have not adopted those uh, at the request of our uh, infection control service at this point. And then we give a dose of maybe post uh, operative antibiotics. Our 18 month infection rate is about 3.8%. Again, we're monitoring it requires a lot of work, you need to have a denominator and then move forward with it and see what we can do to change uh, as we go along. And then, just in this population, we've got a whole bunch of other comorbidities, especially the, area, uh, the elderly uh, population, the NPH population. We've got, uh, it's basically geriatric neurosurgery, and we've got other causes of dementia you have to deal with, you've got uh, hypertension, coronary disease, stroke, obesity, sleep apnea, diabetes, and then anticoagulants and anti-plague drugs. So many patients on anticoagulants, uh, aspirin, uh, and uh, Plavix. And you have to find a way to manage these and occasionally you encounter patients where you're never going to do your assessment and take them off and then these are too high risk. Mike mentioned we actually did a little handbook for the interest in this, uh, trying to provide some guidelines for people with different diseases. Uh, it, but in, in, in our uh, hydrocephalus population, it certainly is a very common thing. I would guess that probably 50% of our lumbar drain patients are on any platelet agents uh, or uh, on uh, <coughs> wagons. Uh, uh, so it's, a, it's an important uh, topic to be fluid uh, in. So finally what we did was we, a number of years ago, we started talking about how do we do this better, how do we move away from this single center uh, bias model, and we put together the adult hypercephalus combo research network. So really we just started collecting data last year, did a lot more effort and work than I thought it ever would to put this together and to get going. So we've got uh, six centers right now. We've had a bit of mobility of uh, some of the uh, uh, PIs. Mike uh, came from uh, Baltimore to uh, uh, Seattle just recently. 
We've got Calgary, uh, Will Purnell, uh, Cleveland Clinic, University of Washington, and UBC, and John Hopkins. So this is a picture from one of our uh, meetings about a year and a bit ago. We've got our data collection centers, the same as for HDRN in Salt Lake. We've got a neuropsychologist uh, who's in uh, Miami who provides expert uh, uh, background and uh, contributes to the group in a major way. We have a core data project, so we're collecting uh, diagnostic and treatment information, uh, neurocognitive data. We also set up quality and uh, assurance measures, so patient, uh, the, the physicians, even the neurologists and the neurosurgeons who are using these cognitive assessment measures have to go through an accreditation process, and a quality assessment as time goes on to make sure we're doing it in a similar fashion. And we're actually putting one together for GATE as well. So these core measures that we're looking at, we're going to try and make sure people are doing them in the same fashion. We're, we have an imaging uh, data bank that's uh, established, and we're also looking at developing a CSF data. <coughs> we're going to understand a lot about natural history and outcomes, a lot more, because as I'll show you in a minute, single center stuff can get you into trouble when you look at the type of types of centers that are out there. And we're going to do clinical trials. So this is uh, just a quick snapshot of the first 161 uh, uh, patients enrolled. You see there are, we have here two types of centers. We have uh, centers where they're mostly looking at NPH and centers where they're looking at all different aspects of hydrocephalus. These are the four groups I talked about. So I think that if you limit your look at certain types of centers, you're going to get what that center offers in terms of the patient population they serve us. By doing this, I think we've got a much better uh, way to appreciate and understand what's happening uh, with this uh, rather uh, heterogeneous patient population. And because there's a lot of NPA patients in you can see the age uh, tends to be a little bit older, but we have patients down uh, in their teens, so we take all numbers, 18 and above. And you can see just a snapshot looking at age distribution by etiology, it fits. Acquired, younger, and pH, much older. In general, right in the middle, these are chronic hydrocephalus patients. And you know, we're looking at uh, an NPH uh, trial, we have a pilot, a randomized trial that's uh, in process, just uh, uh, being set up, and hopefully the first end of the year will be starting that. We're also looking at some trials and showing that, uh, technique assessment. So as I started off saying, it's a, the mission statement's a big job, I think ahead of us, we're gonna improve care for these patients. A lot of things to do, um, and uh, I think you know, uh, giving you sort of that vast sort of overview of all the different, uh, many of the different possible issues. Uh, but I think these can be uh, taken on and uh, uh, we can change these things uh, one by one. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Mark, thanks uh, so much. That, that's terrific. Uh, he and I are, are kindred spirits when it comes to the, the challenges in hydrocephalus. Let's see if there are some questions from Mark Flicks. Or comments or rotten tomatoes. So I have a point in that question also. Um, so I, I notice, uh, I'm from Brazil, so I notice that, that uh, in North America and I, I've seen also in Germany that people are moving to laparoscopy or to do most of the abdominal part of the shunt. So in most of the developed uh, countries, that adds up uh, a new layer of costs, and, and uh, resources are limited. You know? So is there any data showing how much more expensive, or if it's more expensive, adding uh, laparoscopy? Because in the past, that was a very simple and, let's say, cheap surgery. You don't need anybody. The neurosurgeon was able to do the abdominal part very easily, you know. But now you add another specialty, like general surgery, to do a part that was just one doctor was uh, necessary to do. I think it makes something, the surgery that was very uh, cheap, more expensive, in my opinion. So uh, I agree we need to do more economic analysis. I don't think any of the uh, reports that are out there really look at that in a major way. There's one that does a little bit. So I think you have to bring into that uh, how costly it is to deal with the shunt failure. And if we're, and I think uh, uh, if we don't have some uh, criteria for what shunt failure is, uh, we're going to be underestimating, I think, a lot of what happens in shunt function. So the cost of putting a shunt into somebody and not treating their problem properly is something that also has to come into the equation in addition to the additional cost of laparoscopy. And there are 
you know, I think this is a, something that's in evolution. I think it, it's got a lot of work that needs to be done to sort it out. Uh, as I said, there's different types of laparoscopy. But I think you have to take into account both of those. So the simple surgery idea, yes, it was a simple surgery, and I did that simple surgery for a very long time. But as you do more and more of them, you realize that it comes with the burden of failure to accomplish what you try to with surgery. Right back here. Um, it seems like there's, I agree with your lack of interest in neurosurgeons to tackle these problems. I think that it's the 800 pounds in the room. None of us have any interest in this surgery and this disease process. And it seems to me that the problem is not lack of data. So how do you, how do you, how are you going to go about changing that, that problem beyond this data? And it's not the reason why we're not interested in it. I think part of the problem is it's a lack of good data. It's a lack of, I think, uh, uh, we're at the same plane, place the functional neurosurgery was uh, a number of decades ago uh, when there wasn't much formalized in each program. I think, uh, I think you have to get programs one by one to take ownership. We have to encourage uh, young uh, trainees and younger neurosurgeons to get interested in it, provide uh, a possibility of an academic career that can be made in this. And I think there is uh, a lot that can be offered and it's, it's improving. The environment's improved. <coughs> we need to have more public awareness. And so there has to be some, it's, it's got to be a push and pull thing. So the public has to be made more aware so they can push and say, you know, we need to have this particular element of neurosurgical care looked after and we need to respond to that. And, you know, in Canada, it's been a, uh, long process from being the only person in the room talking to. Now we have you know three or four places where they have adult hypercephalus clinics that are set up, gradually building. So it, it, it can happen. Uh, the Hypercephalus Association is a very important patient advocacy group. They can be a partner in this. So I think you know a big part of this is taking ownership and providing opportunity. You know, <coughs> the idea of uh, whether it plans But I, uh, I actually have a design for uh, at least a laparoscopic trial uh, that uh, we, we've been working on. It's uh, the, the numbers needed uh, are, are not uh, not very like they're, they're pretty significant. So, it's, but it's, it's something that, that's on the horizon. Uh, in terms of learning how to do laparoscopic uh, care, I think that. Uh, People entering into the field now, if that becomes a standard, can certainly be trained and taught to do that. Uh, my experience in working with uh, the general surgeon uh, is that that I, I, I saw, uh, that's working with me right now is that some of these bell bellies we get into are a bloody mess, and it's uh, you need to have uh, you have to go through a formal I think, a process of training to be skilled enough at it to deal with some of the potential complications. Uh, it's amazing again, as I mentioned how messy it is in some of these abdomens and putting a catheter into the blindly is not I think, the, uh, the best way to do it. But we've got a lot of work to do to, to prove that. Mm -hmm.
kind of a little depressing to wait until you see the cognitive decline before you find out, okay, this, has, this person has hydrocephalus. Do you think uh, it takes a long time after that onset of the hydrocephalus until you see the cognitive decline? Or is it immediately very sensitive to, you know? Which patient group were you talking about? Uh, the adult ones, the 58 year olds. The, well, the biggest problem with that group is actually getting our hands on them. Uh, so that they, uh, they've often been, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a set of clinical symptoms that tend to have a very slow onset uh, before people become aware of it. The, the, the outcome, the, the outward effects of memory dysfunction are not uh, uh, sort of uh, linear. So people tend to have this sort of sudden appreciation that they're in trouble or their family members that they're in trouble. Then they're trying to get an awareness, or just somebody that to, to figure out what's happening. Why is a 55 year old becoming demented? So you think they lived for 10 years already with, with the hydrocephalus before you even notice it? Born with this. This is uh, in Are general hydrocephalus. You see this in uh, I've seen this in the pediatric patient population. The argument, that, the thing that we have to sort out is I set up a series of very basic criteria I showed you to treat these patients. And what we don't know is whether we should treat everybody. <coughs> There's a study that's been going on in the pediatric population looking at cognitive measures in, in children with untreated ventricular uh, to see what happens over time. So these are, these are again, more unanswered questions. I think the, uh, as long as you have some criteria, and, uh, we follow these patients, uh, I accept the bar relatively low in terms of concern about cognitive function. Thank you, Doc. I, I have a, a practical question. We've had a run on service in several your own personal preferences in terms of selecting an appropriate doctor for this population? That's our whole hour. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really tough patient population. Uh, so in the, uh, the, the, basically, if, if, if you can do a third ventriculostomy, that usually will make things easier to manage. People usually have a complete uh, separation of the ventricular system from their cortical subarachnoid space. Uh, some of them are extremely challenging to treat uh, if you can do a third ventric, you can often end up uh, without a shunt. Uh, so I put 70% uh, uh, of the patients I treat now with third ventrics we eventually get the bleed off and they cover drain. They don't have a shunt. Do you know that that might have been a well, like a centric ventric and a margment? But, uh, every case is unique, and some of them uh, will uh, drive you insane. They're really, they're really tough uh, patients. The, um, uh, and if I go to a shunt, I use, I don't use a valve, I use a, a catheter in a reservoir. I usually, I've been putting them through a period of, again, not because there's any evidence to guide me, I just had to have something to try to use consistently. I use an externalized peritoneal catheter and then switch up the peritoneal catheter to look at the top of the map. And the, I have, I've gotten, unless they're primary cause of the problem, and these are usually subarachnoid patients, infection patients, and trauma patients, uh, or they, they were, if you go, they've, been, they've had a shunt put in when they were a kid, if you go back and find the history, you can find out they have a lot of problems with their shunt early on. And finally, they reached the equilibrium and they were okay for a while. And with their first shunt malfunction, they crash and burn. Uh, and so third ventricular ostomies are really useful in that patient. So for, if you can get them past that, uh, you can get a large number of them you can get without a shunt. What's that? Just after 8 o'clock. So thank you again, Mark, for a terrific talk and, and for stimulating the talk.